Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today is David Zaretsky. And he's someone that I met recently. We had some very interesting conversations and I wanted to get him on the show. He's the CEO and chief scientist and co-founder of SNPs, which is an influencer network and platform, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. He's also an adjunct professor at Northwestern University, and he's at the Farley Center for Entrepreneurship. And he's also an adjunct professor at DePaul University College of Computing and Digital Media. And David, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's really great to be here. So, you know, one of the things that we, the, so one of the things that we're going to talk about is kind of AI in general, but we're going to leave that for a little bit later in our time together. One of the things though, that brings that up is that you have co-founded uh, this uh, platform and influencer network called SNPs, and you're also the CEO and chief scientist there. So you know how it works. And, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about it. And and as I understand it, you're leveraging AI there to make that whole thing better for both sides of that equation. Yeah, and it, it, it's such an exciting area and such an exciting to talk about. Um, and I wish I could talk about it all day. <laughs> there's, there's, so many, there's so many great uh, things, um, you know, in, in influencer marketing in general has really become such a, a big uh, concept, especially over COVID. You know, when yeah. everybody was shopping online and how do I, how do I communicate my brand uh, to people if I can't get them into the retail stores? And, and so influencers really have, um, you know, uh, become this really big part of every sort of marketing strategy. I think I was just reading some latest statistics. They were saying, I think, uh, I think this year was supposed to top over a, um, a billion um, over a billion dollars in marketing spent and, or maybe it's 3 billion, I think this year, maybe 4 billion next year. So there's a, there's a lot of, um, uh, really opportunities in, in the influencer marketing space. But the great thing about it is that from an entrepreneurial perspective, anybody can be, uh, become an, uh, an influencer. We're all mm -hmm. influential, uh, amongst our peers or communities. And, um, from our perspective, you know, when we first started out SNPs, we didn't really look at things like followers as the the, the, the uh, uh, metric that identified people as influential. We looked at at things like, you know, can I drive my audience, my friends, my colleagues to take some measurable action, right? Mm -hmm. And that action is, you know, really uh, dependent on whatever the brand is looking for, whatever you you know you're looking to do. Get, can I get them to listen to my podcast? Can I get them to watch a video? Can I get them to purchase? There are many different things. Um, but, uh, and scaling that is obviously, you know, interesting to brands, but um, from, from really being influential, you don't need to have a million uh, followers to be, to start a career as an influencer. You can really start from, from the get-go. And so SNPs, we, we started out as really a platform for influencers. We developed a whole suite of tools that allow influencers to create and share content, schedule their posts, engage with their audience, measure, gain you know a lot of insights. Not just you know uh, what I call the vanity metrics on social media, yeah. but also a lot of clicks, a lot, a lot of um, uh, psychographic and demographic information about their audience, and then also being able to measure that all the way through conversions and sales. Yeah. Um, and so, so now you have a full platform. You have all the analytics, all the data that you need to be able to take that to a brand and show them, hey, I'm able to really move the needle uh, for your brand what, at whatever scale. Um, and then on the brand side, we have a whole end-to-end -end platform for working with influencers and, and managing the whole process. But our key focus has always been since day one being a performance driven. And, um, and so we developed these various different campaign platforms that allow you to work with influencers on different performance models, whether it's to drive sales, drive click-throughs, drive contest entries, uh, vis the viewability, and all these things can that you're allowed to measure now and uh, track that, again, from social media all the way through the sales um, and, and do that automatically. So it's very mm. streamlined and uh, it's very, something very unique in the, in the influence marketing space that we're doing that really um, sets us apart from others. But 
uh, as it kind of relates to AI, you know, uh, we, we do a lot in terms of um, on both sides, both with the influencers and, and the brands. And uh, as far as fraud uh, detection is one of the biggest hurdles that brands are facing yeah. today that, um, you know, there's a lot of fake accounts, fake engagements on social media, and those mm. are really closed systems. Uh, yeah. Brands don't have a lot of insight into how, you know, how can you uh, um, identify if, you know, somebody is using, um, you know, these Instagram pods, Facebook groups, and other means to inflate your traffic, inflate your likes, inflate your, you know, these like for likes and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, we took a very active approach by introducing real-time fraud protection. This is just one example of how we're leveraging AI. Yeah. Um, to be able to eliminate over 99% of non-human traffic from all of our performance campaigns, right? Um, a normal brand would not be able to do this through a Facebook or Instagram because they have no visibility into that traffic. We can do that in real time um, through the engagement. So these are just some examples. And uh, we also leverage all of the data that we're consuming from the outside, such as aggregating news and music content and, and turning that into uh, um, a sort of uh, opportunities to automatically recognize uh, elements of, of, you know, what are, what are people talking about in real time? Mm. If you and I are having a conversation, and uh, the other day we were talking about uh, Blue Origin, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> the, it's a fascinating week just in, in the AI space to have this, you know, uh, this uh, shuttle take uh, you know, the, uh, automatically, right, autonomously take these people into uh, into the atmosphere and then back down and and land with pinpoint accuracy, right? You couldn't do that with yeah. AI, right? Um, yeah. We were talking about that, and if I were to just say Blue Origin in a social media post, how do we know what Blue Origin is? You know, maybe it's yep. a new type of drink. <laughs> it's right. A, maybe it's a car. I don't know, right? So yep. how do we know what the context is? And um, through SNPs, through our AI platform, we're able to consume all of the news content from all over. And, uh, and then using natural language processing, we can start to identify in real time, what are people talking about, what's the context, and things like that. And that, uh, that really opens up the door um, for analysis. And, and, and these are just some of the interesting things that we're doing with respect to AI and how we're trying to improve the communications and uh, tools that are available to both brands and influencers. So what do you think are some of the, the you know, because I think that when you say influencer marketing, I think stuff comes up for people. Some people think awesome. Some people maybe less awesome, right? I mean, it's a mixed bag like life. What are some of the things that you've noticed out of your work with influencers that you think could be good for leaders to know or for leaders to think about? Is there anything like that for you? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, business leaders themselves are highly influential and yeah. there's a whole other, you know, B2B influencer, you know, side of things uh, where, where, you know, brands are looking for prominent leaders to talk about, you know, best, best use cases, mm. especially when it comes to things like AI, right? Um, and, and, and new concepts, new ideas. How do I integrate this with my brand? What are things I should be thinking about? And, uh, you know, in my, in my class that, uh, I have this class that I put together at, at, uh, Northwestern at the Farley Center, which is, um, uh, it's called Newvention AI Analytics, and it focuses on, uh, students building a company around AI. And we bring in thought leaders from all different areas to talk about, you know, uh, how, how do I think about AI and AI ethics and um, business strategy and how do I think about technology and all the legal ramifications of AI, uh, you know, yeah. two, five, 10 years down the line, right? And, and um, so each of these business leaders themselves, you know, are really learning to, um, uh, you know, uh, share their knowledge and their, their wealth of knowledge to these other audiences and to, you, you really can use that as a way of building your own brand, yeah. uh, learning to communicate and being a more thoughtful leader and then, and taking that message to social media uh, and, and creating uh, really just a great community, right. Uh, yeah. of, 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 you know, people want to listen and share, uh, understand your own insights and experiences. Yeah. And so, um, I'm, yeah. 
by the way, David, I I neglected to say this, but if you want to find David, here's the easiest, quickest way. Go to linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash David Zaretsky, D-A-V-I-D-Z-A-R-E-T-S-K-Y. So linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash David Zaretsky. So sorry to interrupt you there, David, but I want to make sure people got that so they could go find you if they wanted to. Thank you. So, so business leaders, I mean, for them to think of themselves and to really take it on like they're influencers is certainly one great thing we can learn. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it doesn't take a lot of effort to do that. Yeah. Right. It's a few posts. It's sharing content, adding their own, you know, uh, insights, their own understanding, uh, their own experiences to their posts. Yeah. And from that, it really just kind of evolves over time. Well, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about because of the work that I do is the fact that uh, if you as a leader have your, you've got a lot of experiences, right? Most leaders have a lot of experience. And yet if you have, if you don't have well chosen, well crafted, well told stories about that experience, then it is then its value is vastly diminished because no one else is benefiting from those stories and from that experience because they're locked up inside my head as a leader. I haven't taken the time to really get some good stories to tell about all that experience. And, you know, so I'm always trying to remind people that storytelling is just sharing your experience. And, uh, it's very, very important. It's a way to leverage that experience and make it vastly more valuable than if it's just riding around by itself in your head. But I think what I'm hearing and what you say is that there's another level to that. It's not just telling those stories here to the people right in front of you or your team or whatever. You could take those stories out to social media and the leverage that's available for those stories and that experience and the difference that your experience makes in that venue just is massively multiplied. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, you, there's so much more potential once you can broadcast that message to a larger audience, right? It's, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's different strategies of, of how to do that. I don't want to, you know, to, you know, if you just put a, out a post, you're not yeah. going to automatically get a million followers, right? Sure, uh, of course. So there's work involved there. But, um, you know, it, and, and from the business leadership sort of standpoint where you come from, uh, getting out there and speaking, um, getting on podcasts, uh, engaging with people, um, you know, going to conferences and things like that, these are all great ways to kind of build your own brand. Um, mm. and, uh, and so certainly encourage all of that. But, uh, you know, I think that there's, um, uh, you know, from just a, a, I think business leaders in general should always consider ways in which they can, you know, uh, get their voice out because they have these unique voices and people really want to learn from the top of the, uh, the top people out there, right? Yeah. The CMOs, the CEOs, um, CTOs, all uh, CIOs, right? All of the struggles that they're facing, you know, smaller businesses, other people are, are, are you know, they need to learn from these people. This is not something you're taught in school. We yeah. try to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? But yeah. a lot of the stuff you learn on the job and, and, you know, cybersecurity is a huge issue right now, right? Oh, um, so, you know, what are CIOs thinking about in CTO in terms of mm. securing an infrastructure? And then uh, we had this blackout uh, the other, the other day, right? That took down a bunch of the top websites from, I think it was Alchemy, uh, uh -huh. that, uh, you know, goofed up and put out some, <clears throat> some software update and, and knocked down, knocked out all these big yeah. uh, oh. companies, all their networks and stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, what, what happens in those situations? How do we prepare mm. for the inevitable <laughs> yeah. uh, catastrophe? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so people, people need to learn that they need to be aware of these things and thought leaders who've experienced these. Uh, um, uh, things can become, you know, uh, leaders and, and thought leaders and influencers who can help others and teach them how to, how to prepare. Right. Yeah. Well, and you know, you, you remind me of one of the things that I, that I think I need to keep reminding people of, which is the fact that, you know, 
a lot of people will th- that I encounter think that you know they yeah well you know John I mean you've got exciting stories you train the astronauts you ran away with a rock band I mean you have exciting stories I don't have any exciting stories who wants to hear what I have to say well here's a few things about that like first of all if something happened in your life and you still remember it at this age <laughs> probably something it was probably significant somehow and you learned some lesson and if you're willing to go look into that thing that experience that you still remember cuz think of all the experiences that you don't even remember but if that one stands out as one you remember there's something valuable in that for you and guess what i'm a human being too if you share that well it would be valuable for me too and what you just said david is really really big because people don't want to share what struggles they're going through right like we we all get kind of drawn towards sharing the awesome stuff, right? Look at social media. All people post up there is, oh, look, I'm on vacation. You know, it's like, but the real value comes from hearing about the difficult times and hearing what it is that you're struggling with right now. And what are your, you know, what is your, what's your mental model for this? How are you dealing with it? What, what do you think? You know, l- maybe engage people in a conversation. That's the really valuable content yeah. from what I've seen. Would yeah, you, you know, I, I, absolutely. I would, I would say that, you know, uh, a really, a real successful entrepreneurs don't learn from success. They learn I, from failure. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, I and, right. uh, and I think uh, every, I'm an entrepreneur. I think every entrepreneur out there who's kind of gone through this journey um, has really, you know, had their ups and downs and um, they've learned how to create and myself, right? Uh, I've learned how to create processes to manage things so I don't have to worry about them all day and night, right. yeah, you know, yeah. and, and I could teach those processes to other people. If you're starting your business, here are some things that you sh- you can do to automate, right? And, yeah. and, uh, and so, you know, a lot of these things will be on autopilot and you don't have to think about them, right? If something yeah. goes down, I get an instant alert. Right. Mm -hmm. If something goes down, I can immediately go and fix it. I don't have to wait for a a customer to complain. I can, (laughs) right. And, and so those are, you know, these are the things that uh, every small, uh, small business or medium business or even an entrepreneur or startup um, needs to know about. And business leaders have so much wealth of knowledge, not just technical and business knowledge, but also how they balance their life and business. And, and, you know, what struggles they've had personally and stuff like that. Uh, um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs just kind of, they don't even think about it. It's not even on their yeah. radar. <laughs> right? Right. What, what do you do when you got a family and you have, you have to yeah. start a business? Um, right. So. Yeah, absolutely. Right. What, uh, that mentorship, I think is so important. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, and, and, uh, at SNPs, you guys are applying artificial intelligence, and and so let's go to a more general discussion about that. And and uh, you know, I understand that there are multiple kinds of artificial intelligence. And um, from our conversation, I think that you're not um, ultra worried right now that Terminator style artificial intelligence is going to take us out anytime soon. Um, you know, I do tend to be a little more worried on that front, although I get it's not going to happen like tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, I would love to understand your perspective on, you know, how do you break down the different types of artificial intelligence and what's actually, you know, and I think machine learning gets tossed in with artificial intelligence that may be warranted or not at times, I suppose. So do you want to just decode that world for us a little bit? Sure. then? And then let me throw my biggest artificial intelligence complaint at you, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so I've been doing AI um, for well over uh, two decades. Um, I actually started out back in when I was doing research uh, in my master's and PhD research. We were implementing elements of AI. So there's a lot of different parts of AI, right? You can get into computer vision and there's machine learning is just one type of AI. There's regression. There's, you know, uh, so there's a lot of different uh, different elements. And um, uh, and I can tell you a story. You know, when I was in uh, uh, just finishing up, uh, I think it was my under uh, undergraduate, 
I, uh, that's right. It was, I just graduated. I, I was working at Case New Holland, which is a, you know, uh, they, they build, um, uh, agricultural equipment, you know, uh, uh-huh. stickers and other stuff. Yeah. And I was working on a, the, uh, some of the first autonomous tractors. Wow. Was in the, working in the advanced technology department, this, we built out this tractor, um, in, in conjunction with, um, University of Illinois, one of the professors there. And uh, this tractor was able to plow the fields automatically for you. We use GPS. We were actually able to get uh, close to centimeter accuracy. Uh, wow. There was no room for error when you're plowing yeah. your fields. Yeah. <laughs> if the yeah. tractor goes uh, off, veers off to the left, you've destroyed all your crops, right? Yeah. Um, so we were doing autonomous vehicles. This is back in 2000. Wow. Right? You know, this is way before. Now, now we have you know, companies who are trying to build out you know, autonomous ca- cars on the on the highway and stuff, right? But uh, these are, you know, using a whole, uh, many different elements of AI. Part of it is, you know, uh, and, and they're not just uh, just AI, there's other aspects to it as well, but we're using computer vision, we're using, uh, um, you know, other things to identify um, potential objects and things in the way and, and so on and so forth. So mm. uh, in, uh, object recognition. But to nowadays, when we kind of think of AI, I think probably the most prominent, uh, there's, three key areas. There's Mm. obviously a lot of areas, but the three key areas is in supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, Reinforcement learning is not studied as much these days in in class. Reinforcement learning is typically um, you you learn as you go. So a a classic example would be you put a robot uh, on the room and every time it hits the wall, it gets some negative feedback. It's that reinforcement and it starts mm. to learn the boundaries of, of yeah. the like object. a Roomba maybe or something. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, so that, so you're not pre, you're not giving it a, uh, you know, a map in advance. It's just going out and discovering when I was working on the tractor, these autonomous tractors, uh, we plotted the map first. So we took it through the map and so it had the original map. And then the idea was to, go back along the map, but also using computer vision to keep it uh, from veering off into, uh, into the crops, right? Mm. Um, so that was then one element. The uh, unsupervised learning gets into, uh, uh, you know, the probably the more popular would be clustering. Um, and that's when you just have a, a bunch of data points and you're trying to find correlations between uh, different data points. Uh, examples of that might be, you know, where we're, uh, uh, we're all sitting in a park, everybody's sitting in the park using their phones. And, uh, you know, maybe some people are watching videos and some people are uh, watching uh, or reading the news. And so if we can identify all the people who are watching the videos, we can sort of cluster them together. These are video watchers. And then we can identify people who are watching, you know, watching the news. Those are news readers, right? And so the clustering is just taking in all this information, just finding correlations between them. Uh, and then the, the the ones that are studied probably the most in class is going to be the uh, 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 classification, which is the supervised learning. And that the idea there is that we're taking historical data, and we are learning from the historical data, and then using that to predict new data, uh, or or given some new input, we want to predict the output for that. Uh-huh. And um, and a couple of models, the regression is one a class example. That's where you have numerical input. And you're trying to predict a numerical output. Mm-hmm. So if I, if I have a history of of uh, prices for the uh, you know homes that are sold in my neighborhood, and I want to predict you know given you know the number of rooms, um, number of bathrooms and stuff, uh, I want to predict what the sale price is going to be. Right. So that would be a regression model. Okay. And then we have uh, we have uh, the classification model, which is kind of where all the image processing comes in. So this is where you have. Yeah facial recognition, right? So uh, I, I get uh, 100,000 images of different people and I'm trying to classify the gender, age, race, um, and things like that, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and and so you're, you're kind of learning from, and that could be applied to text as well and others. So those are sort of the, the three key areas, right? That we typically study or yep. are, are applying most of these days. Again, there's a lot of other areas, but yeah. Um, so getting back to your original question, which was the, uh, you know, uh, the Terminator, <laughs> Terminator days, right? Yeah. Um, the end of the world. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, I think Hollywood has done a really great job of romanticizing this idea of AI and sentient beings that are going to take over the, we, you know, the yeah. shows like Westworld and stuff like yeah. that. I think we're away many, many years off from that. I think we're still many years off from actually adopting, you know, <laughs> these autonomous vehicles uh, from taking us everywhere automatically. So we still got some time from that. <laughs> but yeah. I, I think there's a misnomer of, in AI that AI is this sort of evil thing that uh, is being used to manipulate people and stuff. And really what it is, it's another uh, way of just, you know, uh, solving problems or identifying patterns in data. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just like, you know, and I, I, I see this as being, you know, sort of the next evolution education, kind of just like if I, if I were to get a degree in computer science or computer engineering, you might take some core classes in network network um, or compilers or operating systems, you'll likely have a machine learning, uh, you know, core class mm-hmm. because it, it's just like, you know, uh, physics and algebra and stuff. It, you're learning equations and ways of solving problems um, that normally would take hours, days, years to solve. We can now solve those problems um, in much less time, yeah. right? Uh, in, in fractions. It's already solved at once. And now I can apply that to solve new problems in fractions of a second, right? Yeah. Nanoseconds. Um, and so there's a lot of interest and in, 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 that, that is built up around this because it really changes how quickly we can uh, evolve um, our technology and businesses and things like that by identifying opportunities for success or opportunities yeah. to prevent c- catastrophe. Um, example. Uh, of that is um, I was working, I had a a company that I was working for uh, where we were working with NASA and the DOD to uh, life, we're lifing, our technology was lifing engines and transmissions for helicopters, uh, commercial and and, uh, military aircraft. And the idea was that, you know, you and I, uh, if we were to drive the same car, right, um, I might be a more aggressive driver than you, you know, the, 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 car, the dealer says, bring back the car after 5,000 miles for, um, you know, for the first upgrade, right? Yeah. But I might, if I'm more aggressive, I might stretch the boundaries of, you know, how soon you should take it in for maintenance, right? Yeah. The same yeah. thing with airplanes and, and uh, helicopters, especially in the military. Yeah. If you go into, um, you know, a climate uh, uh, where there's uh, a, you know, uh, um, high altitude um, or you... Uh, um, have, like you're uh, landing in the Middle East where there's lots of sand. Yeah, right. So, so all of those things have effects on on the engine maintenance. And so, if you can detect problems early, you can bring it down for maintenance earlier and, and avoid catastrophic yeah. damages. We we've yeah. all heard you know news articles about unfortunately a plane to have just uh, crashed or, or had other issues um, mm. during flight. They didn't catch certain issues. So. Uh, we were we were working on that, and those types of models in AI are are great. They're helpful. They they help us prevent and avoid catastrophic damage. Right? Um, yeah. Not all AI is bad. I think where AI yeah. gets into a murky issue is when we start to apply that to humans. Mm. When we're trying to get into personal identifiable information (PII), yeah. right? And uh, and when we're using AI to predict. Um, your, your purchase behavior or, you know, uh, where certain, uh, you know, uh, companies might be using it to manipulate people into, you know, whether it's purchasing or trying to sell their data or whatever that is. Right. Um, so, so I just, I want to, I want to kind of set uh, or differentiate those two because I think they're yeah. important in the general well, sense, AI from a business and technology standpoint does amazing stuff. And, and uh, it, it's the new sort of the new frontier in terms of technology. It's going to really help uh, evolve our technology and catapult us. Uh, at the same time, I think, you know, and this is a, a, probably a wider discussion is just is how do we um, avoid these issues, uh, whether it's bias or, or, or selling or creating data around people's personal information um, that, that can then be used for um, you know, negative uh, uh, opportunities or, or, yeah. or to uh, right to other things that are maybe are not 
good for society. Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, the upside of AI is pretty obvious and I, we wouldn't be pursuing it with such vigor if there weren't a big upside. And, you know, General Electric has a digital twin for every one of the uh, engines that they put onto airplanes. They're running a digital twin all the time. So that, and when, if that digital twin, you know, they can see the wear and everything by simulating what the actual engine's going through. And so just like you said, they can pull that off for early maintenance if it seems like that's going to be warranted, or they can let it go a lot longer than they thought they could because it's being, uh, you know, it's it, it's not being um, worn as quickly. However, you know, that other, the other area of AI that you just mentioned, I mean, I think probably many of the people listening have seen the movie, The Social Dilemma. And that's certainly my biggest complaint is that we took, I mean, and I guess it's not even a highly sophisticated AI. It might just like, you know, the terms better than I do, but um, we did pay some of our most talented computer scientists absolutely ridiculous salaries for the last, you know, 10 plus years to create our quote unquote artificial intelligence, whose end result has been to just absolutely magnify our differences and divide us and show us the most, uh, you know, the most controversial extreme content that leans in whatever direction we might have a slight lean in. And, and I just think that that is, you know, I, I, I've said more than once, and I do actually believe it. If we don't solve the social dilemma, if you will, that got posed in that movie, I don't think we're going to solve another major problem on Earth as a species. Yeah. Um, it, you, you break up such a great point there. Um, so, I, you know, there's, there's kind of two things I would say to that. Uh, one is, is that the and, and and as an educator myself, and I teach uh, AI and and machine learning, and and more so at a at a nano level, so in in uh, mm. uh, at the uh, scale of of circuits and things like that as well. Uh huh. And and so I see it from many different perspectives. But yeah. the interest in learning AI is it has really exploded computer science. And computer science degrees. So, hmm. um, so uh, in the long term, I don't see social media uh, companies first and foremost uh, capitalizing on all the AI people out there. Um, there's uh -huh. going to be a lot of AI uh, folks who are going to be studying this stuff. From, you know, maybe even in high school. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, right. I, I've talked to I've talked to some brilliant kids in high school who are starting to learn this stuff. So it's, um, I think it, it, it's not um, a, a, as sort of science fiction-y as it sounds. It's really, you know, just learning another discipline. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, not that, it's not that difficult, really, to apply these types of technologies. So you're going to start finding a lot more, you know, machine learning, AI, computer science uh, experts that are going to be all over. So I think the opportunity to bring them and create, creating more diversity and and so on is going to be first and foremost. I think uh, we'll, we'll be seeing a lot, a lot of that. Um, the second part to that is, you know, how the, many of these social media companies have um, utilized, and not just social media, but uh, you know, obviously with Google and other yeah. others as well, right? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> how they they, they do, uh, you know, track audiences. They 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 can know everything that you're looking at, what you're reading, uh, what you're viewing. They're even uh, look, looking at every video and frame by frame, they can analyze, you know, the videos, what's in the videos, the topics and stuff like that. So they, they really know every ounce of detail about yeah. what your yeah. interests are, maybe even more so than <laughs> the way you do. Oh, yeah, uh, I think so. And, I think that's <laughs> an easy argument to make. Right. And, and you know, Gen Z uh, kids are really have become – uh, more, more so, I think, open about data. It's not really top mm. of mind. I think it's just our generation has been a lot more, you know, uh, has been more cautious about it. Sure. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, I think that um, people have become sort of, you know, left to, to uh, uh, under, you know, uh, uh, just appreciate that, you know, these are great platforms that have 
purpose. And as part of that, they also offer services to brands mm-hmm. advertise to me and I don't yeah. click on the banner ad. So why do I care? Yeah, <laughs> right. 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 Um, so some people are just, they, they're just okay with it. Yeah. They don't, they, they don't mind. Um, and the other flip side of it is that there are people who do mind. And I think that those people um, should voice their concerns and we should have ethics and uh, ways in which we can control the d- use of our data, how it's being used and, uh, and certainly how, um, opening up for more competition uh, with these other platforms so they don't dominate yeah. um, and, and uh, hold the reins on not just the data, but also um, our lives and what we can see, what we can't see, uh, yeah. and controlling that information, I think, is really important. Yeah. Boy, amen. So from your perspective, I mean, getting all the way down to the nano of artificial intelligence, let's just say that I'm I'm an entrepreneur or I'm running a large organization or a medium organization or something, what are some of the things that you think people should keep their eyes on the horizon for? Like what, you know, what's, what's coming and what do I need to think of as a business leader in terms of, of AI and what's going on? Well, um, there are, I would say that there's also certain, um, uh, adjacent technologies that are also popping up. Um, that, that are kind of interesting to think about as well beyond AI. Now, obviously, um, computers are getting faster. We're getting, you know, laptops with multiple cores and stuff so you can take advantage of it. Yeah. But one of the things that's really interesting is that we, is that, you know, if you looked at the, um, the latest M1 chip by Apple, right? Which yeah. is now in, in all the laptops and the, uh, iPads and, and probably iPhones, I think as well. Um, they're no longer these single, you know, or multi-core CPUs. Now what you see are these system on chip um, uh, technologies that include uh, accelerators, right? What are accelerators? They're basically um, hardware uh, components within, the, within the, the M1 chip that we can offload some certain types of computations to. The, uh, for example, if you were doing video games, if you were running a video game, uh, a lot of the uh, graphics processing, uh, you, once upon a time, we used to have what are called graphics cards that you used to put in your... I, I remember, yeah. <laughs> right? They were expensive. Uh, <laughs> yes. And they were, they were, those were essentially graphics accelerators, right? Now oh. they're built into the chips. So then we have these GPUs, the general purpose uh, uh, processing units, right? Um, or graphics processing units. Uh, that allow us to uh, accelerate um, those, and they're tightly coupled to the CPU, so we can offload those instructions to the GPU. What Apple has done now is that beyond the GPUs, now we have machine learning accelerators and neural accelerators um, and, uh, and, and other components there that allow us to now take advantage of machine learning applications and offloading those to these systems. Now, the questions, uh, uh, question is, how do I take advantage of those 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 accelerators? Right. Um, yep. Normally, uh, you know, if you're um, if you're coding, um, you you know, if I just code something up, it's going to put it onto the CPU. If I wanted to take advantage of the GPU, you'd have to insert certain instructions, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to offload those to the GPU, right? And so um, so now we need to reimagine how we're coding to take advantage of these new system on chip accelerators, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's changing the dynamics and that goes into uh, everything from, uh, you know, computer software to uh, apps that are running on your phone to yeah. any, anything else, right? We need to be able to take advantage of those hardware accelerators. Um, that's just one element of yeah. where things are going. Um, the second is, uh, you know, quantum computing is a big conversation these days and uh, that's a whole other conversation, but uh, it's a very is, interesting conversation. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, and as exciting as it is, it also opens up a, a plethora of, of problems, right? It's yeah. Because we have all of these, um, you know, hashing schemes and, uh, and algorithms that we've used for encoding passwords and stuff like that, um, that, we, that are typically unbreakable using a brute force method. Um, it would... <laughs> take so many years to compute that it's not worth the time and power. But now comes things like quantum computing. And now you have 
potentially the capability of cracking these codes in a matter of seconds. Yeah. Um, and oh. so it, it changes how we think about hashing and, and yeah. uh, password protection and other things, right? Um, brute force is no longer, you know, something that, that can take uh, a millennia. It's, it can be done in, in fractions of a second. Um, and, and so now you have a, a handful of companies who have access to this type of technology, right? It's not, it's not everybody. There's going to yeah. be, you know, an IBM and a Google and, and so on. And, and so now, you know, who, who has access to that type, the type of technology and what is yeah. it used for? And, uh, and so it's going to open up another Pandora's box, you know, and oh, boy. we're not there yet with the, you know, it's still sort of in its infancy, but you know, you can imagine in the next five to 10 years, they'll have some pretty big advances. And yeah. so cybersecurity is going to be a huge issue. You know, yeah. by the time you even you've even recognized that there <laughs> was a hack, yeah. it's already been done, and all the data is taken from you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's it's going to be. Well, I think I encourage people to start reading a little bit about what what quantum computing is and capabilities yeah. and how uh, it's been evolving so quickly. Um, what the capabilities will be, and and because uh, um, those will definitely play a role, I think, in, in not just in cybersecurity, but certainly in terms of business op uh, opportunities, yeah. right? To be able to quantify lots or, uh, of data and being able to process that in fractions of a second to get instantaneous, uh, um, op you know, uh, answers to yeah. uh, uh, problems, stock markets, <laughs> other things like that, right? Uh, so it's it's a exciting, it's exciting, but also kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe quantum computing driven by you know sentient humans is maybe the more immediate fear right like if bad actors get quantum computing like there's just zero security for anyone anywhere <laughs> yeah i mean I, you know to house that kind of of uh system is quite uh, quite a feat right? yeah <laughs> yeah you yeah. would be able to put it into a little module in the in a brain and and just walk around with it i think yeah, you know, we're still we're still many 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 decades uh, away from anything. I think that could really uh, do that. I, you know, it, it's really a you know humans today have are still a part of the equation, and I still kind of believe that that really AI is not there to replace humans. It's uh, there as a tool to make us more uh, to uh, make us more efficient. You know, kind of just like uh, once upon a time, we all rode bicycles and we walked around and then cars were invented. Um, you know, uh, we still went to our jobs. We still did yeah. all the stuff. We yeah. just got there faster. You yeah. know, <laughs> we're able to do a lot more, right? Um, we're able to travel and visit cities and do things we could never do before. And I see AI is the same thing. AI is a tool to improve performance, to help us focus on the bigger picture it's not going to make us dumber. What it's actually going to do is allow us to see more. Um, it's yeah. going to able, uh, give us opportunities to find opportunities and grow businesses and grow technology and uh, enhance our lives and uh, enhance our functionality and help us hopefully bring us closer together. Um, if you can eliminate, you know, these sort of remedial tasks that you have to do all day and re replace them with processes that can identify problems and stuff, I can sleep better at night. I can spend more time with my family instead of uh, <laughs> yeah. worrying about these things. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so I, I look at AI from more of a, uh, you know, uh, a partnership with humans yeah. as opposed to something that's out there to replace, uh, to replace the human being. Well, you know, I, I think that's a good way to look at it um, because I think that it really, for the foreseeable future, it, it it is probably less about AI and more about the people creating and designing and using AI. Um, and, you know, it ends up coming down to it's our responsibility, just like freaking everything else that we want to avoid, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so I think that's a great message is, is, you know, AI, it's a partnership. And really, at the end of the day, it's about what we choose to do with it and what we want to do with it. And, you know, um, I mean, clearly the whole ability to work from anywhere has been a mixed blessing. 
Um, it does mean that we could take more time with our families, but do we end up actually using it for that? You know, is a good question. And I think that's a really, I think that's an interesting place to maybe sort of wrap it up because I know we're coming up to the top of our time, but all these technologies, you know, they are arguably neutral and it ends up being what we do with them. And for so long, these these things were supposed to save us time, but instead of using them to save us time, we just did more stuff. And I think it's uh, I think it's interesting for us as human beings to start because because as these things become radically more powerful and make a radically more you know, a greater difference, we're really going to have some questions about what what are we going to do here, you know? And I think it's an individual level, on a societal level, on a global level. But I think that's a good a good message, David. Is you know? It, yeah, absolutely. And you know, in my class, uh, my Nuvention AI class, we brought in speakers to talk about AI ethics. Uh -huh. And uh, and and there is a obviously a human responsibility. And I, I, I want to differentiate the stuff that we're the stuff that we do in AI for you know uh, uh, technology and and um, uh, medicine and stuff like that. Those are one thing. But when we get into the human element, right, using human data, um, that's kind of where I think the AI ethics really plays a role. But sometimes we need that bias. Sometimes we need to, you know, for example, with COVID, right, with this new Delta variant, yeah. uh, we, we need to identify who's the most susceptible to this. Yeah. And if we were to eliminate bias from the equation, how would we know that certain types of individuals or people who have had, you know, previous ailments and stuff like that are more susceptible, right? right. So sometimes bias is needed. And right. uh, I think if we, you know, there's a lot of legislation going on and, there's a lot of communities trying to come together and putting out um, guidelines of what you can and can't do uh, with AI because they're afraid of, you know, what you're saying is that yep. it's gonna, if somebody's going to manipulate and take over the world. And, um, and there's truth in that, but there's also truth in data. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and we need to be able to uh, see that data, um, whether you like it or not. Um, sometimes we need to see it first and then what we do with that data is really a, um, a, a, a something that you know individuals in society need to understand what what can be done what should be done and what should be maybe put on the on the shelf yeah, <laughs> and, right and just uh, left there for another time yeah. to, to discuss um, but uh, I, I wish there was an easy answer to it but yeah. I, I, I I would say that you know uh, my philosophy is tr there's truth in data and we shouldn't be bashful about about identifying that data wherever it leads us yeah. and then and then you know uh, for, you know making sure that we've eliminated much, as much bias so that we don't apply that data to do harm to somebody but only uh, that we do something good um to help people yeah. Well, David, thanks very much for joining me and talking about this. And if you want to find David, he's at linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash David Zaretsky. And David, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we go? Is there anything I, I should have asked you or anything just to wrap us up here? No, I, I very much enjoyed the conversation. This is spectacular. I'd love, as you can imagine, I'm very passionate about AI and entrepreneurship and yeah. uh, and technology and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share my thoughts and insights and uh, and uh, I appreciate you having me. It's my pleasure. And you know, thanks for being so passionate and thanks for letting your face know. You know what I mean? I think being passionate about something. I talk to a lot of people who are like, "Well, John, you know." I'm so passionate, but no one knows. <laughs> I'm like, well, you got to tell your face. And sometimes it's a little scary to admit you're passionate about something. Someone might, you know, make fun of you or then they got something on you or something. So I, I love talking to people who are passionate about what they're doing, David. And I appreciate you being here and sharing that passion with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. And thank you for joining us. Uh, if you don't already get it, 
I have a weekly training that comes out every Sunday morning, and it is very, very short. And it is a great way to keep your head in the game of leadership and communication. And you can find it by going to executivespeakingsuccess.com and then signing up for the weekly mini training. Go to resources and you'll find a place to sign up for that. Uh, Thank you very, very much for joining us. And I will listen to you next time. This is John Bates, speaklikeleader.show. Have a great, great week. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go be awesome.